Hello there, Mr. Smilodon. How are you doing? Good, Commoner. How are you? Really good. And we were just talking before we started recording, but a Smilodon is a saber-toothed tiger, the first ancient predator. Yes. So very fitting for today's yes, conversation. Yes. A lot of people don't know that. I did not know that, hence my Googling. But I like it. So why did you say Smilodon instead of saber-toothed tiger? Um, well, it's a good question. I think there was actually a, a saber-toothed tiger um, maybe taken or something, but also just like the handle was a little long. Yeah, so I, I was going to say. Kept it short. Yeah, it would be – bowtied saber would be cool too. There might be one of those though. Yeah, that's I think I think there is a bowtied saber, so that's why I, I went uh, – I want to smile it on. Yeah. But it's funny, I, like talking to a couple of people in some of the, um, you know, the live sessions or, you know, the meets or whatever, uh, people have a hard time saying it. Um, some people didn't know what it was, didn't know how to say it. So um, just hope to lighten, enlighten people with it, you know? Yeah. Um, so for those who may not be aware of everything that you talk about on Twitter, can you give a brief introduction mm -hmm. about who you are, what you do, and how you ended up in this corner of the internet? Yeah. So both that smile on. I um you know I've been following the jungle for quite a while. Um, but never really wanted never really dove in. Um what I, I mostly talk about um I predominantly talk about hunting and, and kind of everything related to it. Um and yeah, like the reason I I I chose that kind of niche is to I grew up doing it. Um, it was a big part of my life for, for, for a while. Um, you know, my parents or my dad did it, his dad did it and so on. So, um, it was kind of something that I've always, obviously always been around. Um, and funny enough, like when I, when I first kind of started to do this, I was talking to someone, I was talking to a bunch of people, um, who weren't really familiar with it, with, with hunting that is, um, and I was just explaining to them like the basics of it and you know why I do it, how I do it, all of that. And they were everyone was so interested. So I'm like, you know, let me uh let me jump on this and, and, and kind of run with the Twitter thing and, and it's been fun. So you just described how you started hunting. When did you first go hunting? What age were you? Uh well actually so like actual hunting, kind of going, doing it myself was um by like fourteen. Um, but, but before that I was going with my dad, my dad would take me when I was, when I was much younger, probably, I don't know, seven ish, um, kind of sitting in the woods with him and watching him, I've, you know, been involved in it for a while, but the first time legally that I was allowed to hunt was, was 14 for, for, for big game animals. Um, you know, I probably went a couple of years before that for, for, for squirrels or something like that. Um, but yeah, the, the second I was legally able to do it, I did it. I didn't know that the legal age differed by animal or by like the size of the game. Mm -hmm. Could you explain a bit about what that's like? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so, so basically to get licensed in general, you, you need to take a uh, hunter safety course in most, most states. So kind of preface that with most states are, have their own rules. They kind of vary by state, but for the most part, you're taking a hunter safety course. Um, that age also varies. Um, and generally starts out with small game. So I think your your squirrel, rabbit, um, you know, you can go bird hunting, all of that. Uh usually around 12, 13, 14. Um, and then, you know, two or so years after that, you can go you can go big game hunting. Um so there are two separate courses, kind of one's the intro, kind of general hunting, small game specific, and then kind of gets a little bit more details on the on a big game as well as, as you know bow hunting and, and and all that stuff and that's going by yourself but you could go with your dad much younger yeah and then some states also have youth hunts so you don't necessarily have to be licensed but you can you can go with a, an adult hunter um you know there's rules around that like that hunter can't have a um the adult can't have a weapon with them or you know basically they're just there chaperoning you but giving you a chance to go um, you know, around 12 years old or something like that and, and could take a shot at a um, at an animal. Generally, that's before the season kind of, or the broader season starts for most people. So you'll get like a week or something of, of youth hunt um, to kind of go out and, and go with your kids or something, which is cool. Very cool. I am completely a noob at all of this. So forgive any of my silly questions. Okay. No, but... no, I love it. <laughs> um, so 
when you said you would go hunting and your whole family has been doing it forever, would you go mm -hmm. somewhere nearby, like where you guys grew up? Did you get in the car and drive across the state or was it something that you could go do every weekend? A, a little bit of both and probably starting out was more, um, we had a, we had a hunting cabin that was, uh, you know, like a three hour ride, um, a little bit further away and we'd go, it's been in the family for, for generations. If we kind of just go there, there'd be, you know, my dad's friends, my uncles, cousins, um, you know, my grandfather, his friends. So there was a bunch of us that would just go and that was kind of opening day every year was our, um, a big, you know, big get together. Um, you know, especially as we call the kids go and stuff. Um, then as we got older and we were able to kind of go on our own, like I take a trip with my dad, um, or my brothers and kind of do that uh, on one-off trips, use that, um, and then as we got older, we all got more into it, but additional properties as, you know, as family. And then kind of where we, where we live now, we're able to, um, we're able to hunt. So it's a little bit of a different experience um, than kind of going out in the, in the sticks and doing it. Very cool. Like, I, I don't know anyone who does that. Um, I had one friend in college though, who her dad would hunt and she would go with him. And mm -hmm. when she was like, I want to say 12, she shot a deer with a bow and killed it like perfect shot through the eye or something at 12 years old and she like it was kind of a lucky shot like she hadn't been doing this forever <laughs> and there's this insane picture of her like holding the deer and she's like the sweetest yeah. nicest little thing and so we all just call her like killer Katniss like all these whenever it comes <laughs> up but I, it's very cool yeah and would you do bow hunting or do you use a gun what does it depend on the game what's the weapon so, yeah, so, so there's different seasons. Um, so generally, bow season will start earlier. Um, you you have a longer opportunity to hunt with a bow. There's certain areas um, where my my actual like home is where you cannot hunt with a gun. You have to hunt with a with a bow, and that's mainly because there's not as much property. Houses are closer together, um, so they just want want some you know people firing firing weapons in, in the middle of, of suburban wherever um so you know bow hunting but then there's 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 about a month or two of um of gun season where you can go and this is all um kind of in my home state there's obviously different seasons lengths and all that for um you know, for other, for other game, other, other states, um, you know, I'm, I'm in the Northeast, so it's, it's much different mm. experience and hunting out in the West or in the middle of America. So it's, um, so yeah, predominantly, um, I mean, I love bow hunting. I think it's like the purest form of, of hunting. Um, I mean, I don't go as far as like a, um, you know, a stick and a string, but, um, it, it's as close to it as you can get. Um, but I don't, I, I don't mind gun hunting. I love, um, it's just a different, it's a different experience. So tell me about bow hunting. So I'm picturing mm -hmm. like a giant long bow, but I don't think that's right. What What do you use? <laughs> well, people do. Yeah. So those are traditional bows and those are like the long bows where some people will do that. I, I, I don't, um, some people will say I'm not a purist for doing that. Um, but what I shoot is a, a, a what most people shoot when you're thinking of of um you know bow hunting is, is what's called the compound bow and that is essentially i mean it, it, it's a, it's a cool piece of equipment and um and they've gotten the advancements in that and the technology has been incredible over the past you know 20 years or so um just from like the material that they use the actual technology but but you'll see it, it, it it's basically like picture a bow but at the two top the top and the bottom there are these wheels um and the strings kind of attached to the wheel and as you pull the bow back um you know most people are shooting you know most adult males are shooting anywhere from like 50 to 70 maybe 80 pounds um wow. of, of resistance and but but when you get back a lot of these now have like 80 plus percent let off so you're only holding back you know 10 to 20 pounds or something like that when you're sitting there so it's a much different experience than than using a traditional longbow and where you're kind of um you know just kind of pulling it back and letting it go there's also these different sites that have kind of different um i mean there's a million different sites there's, there's sites now that will range the animal or your target for you and, and adjust the site to you know how far it is and then you can shoot it to me that's a little uh that's a little too much um but but you kind of sight in your bow based on the range um 
you have different kind of markers and you know this is what you know about how far to you know where to put the where to put the pin um based on how far the target is so it's there's a little bit more technology in it than than your traditional you know tried bow so 50 to 80 pounds is the total draw weight but you said you only need to pull mm -hmm. 10 to 20 because of the technology like they've so no so you you have you have to pull back the full amount so um uh, when you're when you're when you're hunting a deer when you're bow hunting a deer um specifically or really any animal it's you're you're most of the time you're hunting from a tree stand or wherever but you're you have to you're moving a lot right so to draw that bow back you have to move your body and you, do, you obviously don't want the animal to see you so you have to kind of wait for the perfect opportunity for the deer to kind of the animal to go behind the tree or mm -hmm. to look, put its head down and eat um or whatever um but that could be at a point where they're not necessarily in range for you um so you'd have to pull the bow back and you could be waiting there for you know, a minute, two minutes until the mm. deer walks into your path and then you can shoot it. So, um, as you can imagine, like pulling that bow back and holding mm -hmm. 80 pounds or 70 pounds back, you're, you're most people are probably not going to hold that. Mm -hmm. Um, so these, this technology now, as you're in full draw, you're fully extended, the weight just significantly drops. So you're only holding back like the 10 to 20 pounds oh. while you're waiting. Wow. That is nifty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it makes it a little bit easier. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's crazy how far the technology has come with all of this stuff. It's, it, it's been, um, I mean, you talk to some of the old timers too, like my uncle and, and grandfather were kind of go off a, a lot on how like commercialized yeah. the hunting industry has been. And, um, and I tend to agree a little bit, but, but I think some of this, this, this other stuff, you know, some of these advancements are pretty cool and just the technology and the gear is, is beneficial. Do they have girly bows or does everyone have to pull back 80 pounds? Oh no, there's, I mean, there's kids bows that, you know, you could pull back 20 pounds. Um, there's, you can literally set it. So, um, usually in 10 pound increments, you can have like a 60 to 70 pound bow, 70 to 80 pound bow, 50 to 60 pound bow, and you can, you can kind of toggle it to whatever you want. So obviously the heavier the bow, like a heavier, the draw weight, um, the more powerful the bow is the, the, you know, the faster your shot's going to be, the farther you can potentially shoot, um, so, you know, so someone shooting a 30 pound bow is probably not going to take a 60 yard shot at a, you know, an elk because it's just not going to, not going to do it. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. How much weight and at yeah. what distance do you need to take down a deer? Roughly. Um, yeah, I mean, anything's possible, right? So, so when you, uh, I was laughing before in my head when you said your, your friend shot the deer in the <laughs> eye because, um, it's uh so when you when you shoot a deer you want it you aim for the vitals right so if you think of an animal right a deer you want to aim basically right right behind the shoulder like the shoulder blades because mm -hmm. that's where the heart the lungs and all that is um so it's, it's a relatively big target so it you, you want to make sure um you know obviously you're shooting before you're shooting at a target before and you want to have everything kind of within a certain um you know, grouping at a certain distance and that's how you're, you, you know, you'll be comfortable with. So perfect shot. Um, I mean, you could probably, sh you could probably kill a deer with a 30 pound bow at 40 yards if you hit it perfectly plus. Um, but I would say, you know, someone, someone shooting, someone newer, someone shooting a lighter bow, like keep it to the 20 to 20 to 30 yards max. Um, and then kind of go out from there as you become more experienced. Mm -hmm. And in order to get to 20 yards, 30 yards from a deer, you need to be sitting mm -hmm. in the tree stand for how many hours? Is it all day long? How yeah. still do you have yeah. to be? How quiet? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's the, that's the, um, that's the big thing. And a lot, I think that's, what may turn some people off to, to whitetail hunting, um, because you are waiting there. It's cold. It's boring, whatever. I mean, the advent of of the iPhones have helped a little bit, um, and portable chargers. Um, but yeah, I, I've sat I've sat literally all day, um, and and not seen anything. So you, you just kind of quote wasted um, eight nine hours sitting in the woods, mm -hmm. um, not doing anything. But but it's not. I mean, I, I personally enjoy it. Like when else do you get that peace and tranquility yeah. and just sit in the woods with the nature? Um, nothing better. 
Um, but, but, but as far as like setting off, like you, you have to kind of know, um, how to read the woods a little bit and kind of understand how the deer may were, you know, may move and walk because you obviously just don't want to plop in a random tree in the woods and you'll just be sitting there all day and never see anything. Um, so you kind of kind of want to understand what their natural funnels are, what their path they may take. Maybe it's between a bedding area and a water, you know, a water source, um, and setting up along an easy kind of natural trail there. Um, because deer are pretty predictable for the most part. Um, they want really like three things. They want food, uh, they want water, they want to sleep. Um, and then during the, during the rut, you know, they want to find a mate. So it's, um, you kind of think about all of that and set up accordingly, um, and, and kind of hope for the best. And, and, you know, we kind of get into that too, but like people will, people set up trail cameras, in areas where they're going to hunt, they prep this, the uh, the land um, to maybe funnel things more, or to give themselves a better shot or clearance um, in the off season. So think like the summers and kind of get that ready for the for the fall, um, just to make their chances of shooting a deer greater. And is the season like confining hunting to the seasons in order to allow the populations to recover? Is it a conservationist effort, or why is it relegated to yeah. the seasons? Yeah, so um, it's usually based around their breeding patterns. Um, so, you know, most of the time they're breeding in the um, you know, late fall, I'll call it. Um, so they'll, they'll, they'll be kind of breeding that anytime after that, like, in, think like now, um, January, February, March, um, they're going to, the, the female deer will be, um, you know, they'll be pregnant and you'll want the, obviously the, um, the population to grow sustainably. So there's like a whole scientific formula. There's, there's biologists, um, who study this stuff and that's how they kind of come up with, you know, the quotas of, of certain species and, um, the, the seasons and all that's kind of based on all that and, and sustaining populations. And, and, and if there's an overpopulated area, they'll extend the hunting season for, another month or whatever so they kind of they kind of look at all of that um and, and kind of make a decision based on uh, based on all of those factors yeah it was really funny so i'm from an area where there's just not a lot of like wildlife running around and so i went to visit mm -hmm. my boyfriend and there were deer everywhere like we had to be careful crossing every street or on the highway because it yeah. pop off and i was like oh my goodness there's a deer he's like they're annoying they're everywhere <laughs> yeah and so i know it's true yeah I yeah pe people pay for that people pay for you know there's the people will pay for hunters to come and hunt on their property just to get rid of them because they're eating their their plants or whatever um you know the the, the, the cars um you know the car accidents and all of that yeah. like it is a little bit of a problem and there's 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 somewhat of a conspiracy um in the hunting industry that the insurance companies have a bigger hand in the formulation of hunting seasons and and kind of the regulations around it uh that then most people think just because you know with zero deer there's zero uh you know car collisions and impacting deer so it's it's kind of to their benefit i don't know how true that is and i've kind of read different studies or stories about that but i just thought it was somewhat interesting wait so you're saying that the insurance companies are lengthening the hunting season so that there's fewer deer around or they're lobbying yeah well they're lobbying for it right so they're you know they're trying to talk to the local um you know wildlife organizations in whatever state and and just lobbying for extended hunting seasons greater quotas all of that that's like, i don't know how true that is uh but it's interesting that yeah it's really interesting that's hilarious is there a rule against shooting like a baby deer not legally um no, like legal ramifications i think it's more of a, a moral or ethical thing from an individual perspective but really anything within season um is is fair game i mean personally i, I don't like you could tell if it's the if it's a doe or an immature uh, an immature deer uh just think about it they're going to be like they were bred in figure november through december um they're going to start dropping fawns in late spring through summer so they're gonna they're gonna be young deer by the time hunting seasons comes around so legally and technically you can take them 
and, and people do, especially in those overpopulated areas. But, you know, if you're going into, like when I go up to my cabin, like I, we're, we're cognizant of that and, and kind of manage it accordingly. Yeah, I was just wondering because I know that there are some, from a conservationist effort, you would just not want to shoot the babies. I, I just have a funny story about that. So yeah. I took a marine biology class in high school. And my mm -hmm. teacher was telling us about this kind of renegade conservationist. And so apparently mm -hmm. in the 70s or the 80s, there were these baby seals in very far mm -hmm. north where their coats were bright white only when they were super young. So like six months of age. And that's what people wanted was the really white fur. So all these different traders and fur guys we're killing all the baby seals because they wanted white fur because eventually it was going to darken into fur that was apparently so ugly they would never want to buy it. And so that was a conservationist hmm. problem because they're going to destroy the population in two or three years because they're killing all the baby ones. And right. the, so the, all these laws were passed, like you have to wait until a certain age until you can hunt this seal or something like that. And then they yeah. ignored it and they kept going. So this renegade conservationist had his own ship. And he would drive up his ship to this the ship of the the hmm. hunters and the the fur guys and say, if you take another seal, I'm gonna sink your ship. And they ignored him, <laughs> and he literally rammed their ship and sank it. And then he, like, and then he turned, he peeled out, and he went somewhere else and did the same thing. And he's just like <laughs> in international waters being mission. hunted down because he was. She, I just think Damn. it's hilarious. Like, that is a nice story. Damn. That is cool. <laughs> I'm totally fine with hunting, but that just makes sense to me to prevent the the babies because. But just a funny, funny guy taking matters into his own hands. Yeah, um, sometimes you got to do what you got to do, right? You got to do what you got to do these days. Um, <laughs> so of all the, what types of game have you hunted? Well, like I said, so, so predominantly white-tailed deer, um, just being in the Northeast, that's kind of what we have. Small game animals, anything from, you know, squirrel and, you know, grouse and all that kind of stuff to, to migratory birds, to so duck hunting, um, geese, all of that. It's so, like, those are like the bread and butter up here mm -hmm. then you can kind of venture to bear hunting up here um, bear hunting which bear hunting yeah so there's there's some some black bear um or a good amount of black bear so that's you know that's kind of what there is there's and then there's predator hunting coyotes um obviously being the I maybe mean, not obviously but being the predominant one in the northeast um so like all of those that's kind of like the big thing and then and then there's turkey hunting you can hunt turkeys in the spring um and in the fall as well so that's always been a nice way to like kind of change up and get out in the woods in, in the spring um and then beyond that it's you know taking taking a couple of trips to to the west where you know you're doing an elk hunt or pronghorn hunt um you know there's there's a bunch of hunts that are kind of on my bucket list that i want to get to you know and hope to, to do with you know my family or whatever at some point um and then, of course, back on the East Coast and in, in Alaska, there's there's the moose hunt, um, which is is kind of tough to get if you're not not a resident in those areas. So um, that's kind of that's certainly on my bucket list as well. I heard that bears and moose are the scariest mofos out there. So how do you hunt one of those with a gun? I Honestly, yeah, you could do either. You could do bow hunt. You can you can hunt the gun. Um so moose, I, I don't have too much experience with them, but from my understanding, like they're they're a little nasty, but 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 I think it's a little overstated just from speaking with someone. I remember uh, chatting with a survivalist a while back and was kind of saying that to him, and he's like, "No, I see them all the time." He's like sending me pictures of them like twenty yards away from him, <laughs> you know, while he's doing stuff around his house. So um, I don't know, maybe he has to touch with them. Uh, but bear, uh, bear can be scary, but but. But really, the, the black bears, um, the black bears aren't, they're a little bit more scared of you than you are of them. Um, if you stand up and spook them, like, they'll, they'll run away. Um, so it's they're, the they're grizzlies cool and the brown hunt. bears that are really scary. Grizzly, yeah, yeah, a grizzly bear, brown bear. Um, those are more, you know, I, I, I've never gone on a, a grizzly hunt. Um, those seem pretty badass, though. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever been in a scenario where you were nervous just around a wild animal 
Yeah, well, so the I was actually spring turkey hunting um, a few years ago, and there was there was a, I saw two small bear cubs kind of running through the woods, and uh, you know in the springtime, and you see two small bears, obviously mama bear is not far behind and mm -hmm. kind of the rule of thumb is never get between a, a mama bear and a and their cubs and sure enough i was smack in the middle of them so i was a little nervous um but kind of like i said i just i just kind of stood up made some noise and the bears ran one the, the little ones ran kind of one way and the mother ran kind of after them around me so that was it was kind of the closest call i ever had um to a uh, potentially dangerous situation, um, but but generally no. I mean, I, it you know I remember being a kid. It was a little creepy, kind of walking through the woods at at night because you're going in before the sun comes up. But I still remember you're you're walking in the woods with a weapon, so if anything kind of pops up, you're yeah. You, you are you are now the go. apex predator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Things. Exactly. Exactly. Um. So when did you start practicing or using a bow or a gun? What was first? How did you learn how to use mm -hmm. it? Well, my dad certainly taught me um, all of that. He's um, the bow was first just because that was the first thing I could I could use to hunt. Um, so I, I remember going in the backyard and shooting my bow at a target and, and just doing that all summer. Um, and then kind of you know hunting with that for, for a while guns were were a little bit later but i was always around them my dad is like very into his guns he's taught you know he's a firearm instructor professionally so like he, he's very he's kind of instilled that in us as well so he you know we'll go up to the cabin we'd always shoot when we were younger in the summer and kind of have a little range there um but i think the biggest thing was even now uh for me is i'm able to hunt i'm able to shoot my bow in my backyard no one will hear it no one will know mm. but if i start firing rounds off um i might get a knock on the door so <laughs> it, it's just easier to um to, to practice with that so do you have a, a target set up in your backyard i do yeah so i have one i have a few um i kind of move them in and out of the um you know the shed or whatever i don't leave them necessarily out but you know you have a couple of bag targets or bone targets you have um some targets that are shaped like an animal um to kind of practice like that so yeah i have a few that that i use and like i said we have a bunch bunch of the cabin as well so i just like to honestly it, it's become a little bit of just a obviously a hobby but, but but like therapy to just go out there and shoot a couple of arrows focus for a little bit and and you know spend 30 40 minutes doing that um it's nice it's very cool if I had one of those, I would totally yeah. use it. I played a mean round of laser tag when I was growing up. So, oh yeah, yeah, I there bet I bet I Do could it. have some transferable skills. So, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> um, one day when I have an enormous backyard, I will definitely have yep. archery range. <laughs> that would be it. so cool. <laughs> and then they'll invite me, right? Yes, and we'll have a little barbecue Perfect. afterwards. That'll be great. Perfect, awesome. Oh, after we Love shoot it. something, what's the tastiest meat? you've ever shot i mean pronghorn's pretty good um i, I mean i love i love just venison white tail mm -hmm. um I, I, maybe just i've used to it i think you know the flavor in that versus beef is, is amazing like my whole family loves it um the kids eat it so it's 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 awesome i have a freezer full of it um and and elk elk's pretty good but like then there's duck like duck's awesome mm. if you if i think it's a little bit of an acquired taste so like i don't know it's all different i just like it all um i don't know that i have a favorite is it noticeably higher quality when you shoot it yourself than if you were to buy something at the grocery store like can you tell the difference yeah i think so i, I think so and it, and it's like i don't know there's a little bit of a story that goes along with it there's totally. like, you kind of worked for it you you earned it um you know i like some people call it free range and organic. I don't know how organic it is these days. Right. Like, who cares? It's, 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 but you can taste it. Like, like cows are literally just sitting there eating all day. Right. Um, it's right. completely different. It's completely different taste. Like they're, they're just fattening off on whatever corn and hay and not doing much. And these deer are out there, especially during, you know, hunting season, they're out there just trying to survive and eating, you know, the purest food and all that. So, um, you could definitely taste that. And, and I think like once you've, for me, like once I once you've eaten it 
for so long and kind of made it a staple in your diet there's there's nothing better and it's kind of hard i mean i still love a good steak but like if someone said here's a steak and here's a piece of venison like i'll probably go venison yeah i don't think i've ever had venison i'm really? not exactly an adventurous get eater, you some. so that's probably my fault but would you eat it i would i would totally eat it i guess okay in the yeah. grocery store i just wouldn't I, do they have venison in the grocery store? I don't even know. My boyfriend and his dad love to go fishing. And they okay. went, I think it's bluefin tuna fishing, the enormous one. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever done that, where okay. you have to basically take turns, everybody on the boat, um, to once you catch one, to oh, basically like reeling it in. tire it out. And so you're all taking turns, oh, like reeling it in, this massive thing. And the only way that you can basically kill it is by tiring it out because it's so powerful and so it's like three or four hours yeah. of wrestling with the reel but um they had tuna for weeks after that and he said it was so good yeah i bet yeah, yeah i bet no i've not done that um i do have some friends that are, are pretty avid fishermen so it's, it's always nice to get a piece of fish from them and uh, you know sharing sharing some venison swapping for some some fish a little surf and turf it's uh mm -hmm. it's nice yeah it's fishing's so fun too because you're just out on the water and it's sunny and it's it's hard to not mm -hmm. enjoy yourself mm -hmm. fishing i can see why that's totally an enjoyable retirement yeah you can time. be so you can be social out there yeah you can be, yeah you can be social you're not sitting quiet in a cold woods um which is why <laughs> i tell people who are who are big fishermen um to, to try duck hunting first because you're sitting in a blind um and you're waiting for ducks to come. So you're like, guys are cooking up breakfast and they're, you know, having coffee, bullshitting. And it's, it's, um, it, 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 it's equivalent to like the social aspect of fishing. Um, and it's a lot of fun. The only downside is that you're usually freezing. <laughs> and is that because of where you are or because of the time of year? Yeah. Both. Uh, time of year and, and, Both. and where I am, <laughs> you know, I'm sure the, I'm sure the people in the South are, are, uh, a little bit more comfortable when they go duck hunting duck hunting versus mm -hmm. geese i'm picturing where you like say you have the giant gun and you're looking at the sky and you shoot in the air mm -hmm. but that's geese hunting mm -hmm. what is that it's both yeah duck, duck hunting same geese. thing yep you're shooting when they're flying that's exactly fine. you're that using a shotgun for that yep yep yeah i think yeah, it is a lot of fun. My boyfriend would never stop doing anything other than that. If he, <laughs> that would be one of his favorite passions. <laughs> and there's people that do. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's awesome. I it's think a lot of fun. Um, it's also like an old boys gentleman thing to do, like the British. Yep. <laughs> I have a, a totally. Yeah. Of doing yeah. That. No, I mean, and there's yeah, I mean, there's there's these hunting kind of clubs or whatever that will they'll have. I mean, they'll stock up on like pheasant or something, and yeah. they'll they'll. they'll Bring in the bring in a ship of pheasant and dump them in the the field they're hunting and and just and just go and shoot them like, but there's a whole uh whole society. Yeah, very cool, very very cool. It makes me want to move out of this city one day. We're working towards yeah. it, but get some land. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, need it. A couple of questions that are often mm -hmm. shot at hunters, if you will. So from people mm -hmm. who probably don't know very much about hunting. So mm -hmm. what is the gun that you use when you shoot? That's a, it depends on what you're shooting, right? And it depends on what your, your preference is. And there's, that's like the biggest like argument within the hunting world is like the best caliber to shoot a deer with. Um, so, I mean, like if you're squirrel hunting, you could use a shotgun um, or you can use a 22 caliber caliber rifle so it's kind of pretty small gun it's like the gun that i would suggest like anyone any kid or anyone who's new to shooting like shoot a 22 it's super fun it's, there's no kickback um so like there's that but then you get into the i mean there's thousands of rounds um or hundreds of rounds that you could be you could choose from um but i'd say most people are probably using like a 30 out six or a 308 or 300 win mag for big game hunting um there's like a 645 creed more which is more for like designed for the longer range kind of the newer caliber on the on the market um and there's guys who just hunt with with a shotgun and they'll use a, like a shotgun slug and hunt kind of whatever with it so um i think if you're 
going to be, do you want to go gun hunting? Um, and you kind of have to get one, one gun, probably get a, a 12 gauge shotgun and you can kind of do everything with that. So I'm not going to lie. Those series of numbers and letters didn't really make a whole lot of yeah, I'm sure. material sense to me, but my, um, I guess what I'm wondering is you don't use an AR-15, do you? Uh, you can. I mean, yeah. there's there's no, like, difference, really, right? That, I mean, you, you could use an AR-15 if you want. Um, I know guys that have done it. But most people are using, like, your standard hunting rifle. It's like a, you know, synthetic stock or a wood stock on there. And it yeah. looks nice and it's got a scope on it. Yeah. And it's like, you know, lever action or a bolt action. Um, pretty straightforward, yeah. I guess what I'm just getting at is people will say that the Second Amendment was meant to mm-hmm. for hunters, basically, which is not the case. Um, just wondering what your take is on that and just guns in general. I gotta go on about that. I, I, I think like the biggest, yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing that I come across is like, especially you know, recently uh, with everything that's that's happened over the past couple of weeks, is like the assault rifle, um, like what exactly is an assault rifle exactly. um no one has a definition for that so like how are you like everyone wants to go ahead and ban assault rifles but no one knows what that is um i mean i have like an ar-15 most of them shoot like a 223 which is similar to a 22 caliber rifle that i was saying to earlier that is like i would recommend for people to shoot there's like no kickback in that so really the difference between that 223 on an ar-15 and a 22 caliber rifle that you're using for squirrel hunting is literally just like one looks like it's a um a military grade weapon i guess and mm. one doesn't mm. and i would i would i would equate that to like like why would you drive like a lamborghini or a porsche that goes 180 miles an hour when you can just drive a honda civic because people want the option to do that so i mean that's kind of like i guess generalized but that's how i think of these people kind of going crazy over these these gun things and i and i think to your point earlier like the constitution was not written for hunters it was it says pretty explicitly that it was to prevent any sort of government overreach and all of that so like i i, I just kind of point to that when someone brings that up to me yeah. um i think hunting is one of the things that people really hate on that don't understand it mm-hmm I wonder why. Is it just because people who hunt are often of a similar political mindset? Is it because it has the guns? Is it because you're outside? Like, I don't really know why it gets so much heat. I guess animal conservationists. So what would you say to someone from PETA? Well, I'd talk to them, first of all. But, yeah, (laughs) I would ignore them. But, like, but but in serious, it's like, I don't know. I mean, PETA, I think that's that's just, like, on another level. Um, I don't think there's rationalizing with those people. Uh, Um... But like your day to day, like I've had conversations with folks who are just ill informed about hunters. I mean, most people aren't aware that all like there's a a percentage of all firearm sales, ammo sales, hunting license sales goes towards conservation efforts. And that conservation efforts is 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 for obviously like hunters and all that, but also it's like maintain trails on 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 trails that whoever is hiking, like anyone's hiking, like that, the money from that is going towards, towards, towards cleaning up that stuff and keeping our parks clean and all that. So like, there's that aspect. And then there's always, there's a thing, especially like what I, what I can't stand is like the, the guy who's like giving me a hard time for hunting as he's shoving a cheeseburger in his mouth. It's like, well, would you think like that just came to be like that, that the cow died for you to eat that. And Mm -hmm. I'm just cutting out the middleman there. Yeah. Um, and I think like what a lot of people too don't don't really understand is like how brutal nature actually is. Mm-hmm. Um, and like if you've seen like you know the nature is metal Instagram or mm-hmm. Twitter account, like it's pretty badass. Like some of these, like if it were me, would I rather like would you rather be killed by a single shot from a hunter who you know well placed shot and you have a really bad like five seconds of your life? and then you're dead or like be eaten by be eaten alive from the ass to the head by a pack of coyotes um over the course of a you know a couple of hours like i'd rather just get shot but um so like all of that like i don't know i think people just don't really understand it um and 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 think we're just all out there to just be like savage murderers who just want to kill everything we see and that's not the case like majority of 
hunters or conservationists and want to keep, even if it's a selfish reason, but want to keep the resources available to them and their next generation so that they can participate in the, you know, the activity that they love. I mean, there's a few bad actors um, who maybe, you know, ruin it for, for most or, 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 or give a bad example or whatever, but like, generally speaking, most, most hunters are, are on board and, and actually like some of the most compassionate people towards animals that I've met. Um, so I think it's just a, like most people are misinformed and there's a big misunderstanding. Yeah. I, I think that's a very fair point. And it comes back to that tragedy of the commons idea. You're giving people, you're allowing people to have an investment in the animals essentially like they are invested mm -hmm. yep. in the animals coming back next season so they are going to take measures whether that's protecting them in some way the money that goes towards the conservation effort it's not taking so many that the population dies which in turn protects the population whereas if you didn't do that you exactly. know who knows so economically it makes ton yeah. of sense i have my own beef with PETA. there's been a lot of fraud claims and just lies um, that I vaguely remember, but they banned kangaroo leather growing up somewhere. And that was, that was my favorite brand of soccer <laughs> cleats. So we had like, <laughs> we had a guy in a different state and my whole soccer team would like go to this guy and he would ship us cleats because we all wanted the same ones. <laughs> and it was pretty And funny. they were made out of kangaroo leather? Yeah, they were made out of kangaroo leather. It's not, they were just like huh. Adidas, like a uh, kangaroo yeah. leather, but, um, pretty funny. They ban them in our state. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I noticed on your Twitter, you were talking about distasteful hunting influencers. I haven't seen any mm -hmm. of those. Could you just walk me through what those are and what they're posting about? Yeah. I mean, I think that tweet was, I'd seen earlier um, that day, uh, this someone who had a social media following and you know, sponsored by whatever hunting brands that he was sponsored by. Um, but it was essentially him, like, he was out on, on one of those, like, fan boats. Um, you know, they drive around in, like, the shallow water mm. in the south. Um, and he was, there was, like, a bunch of coyotes on the um, shallow water. It's kind of walking by. And he was literally just running them over um, and videoing it. Oh. And, like, that was the video that I saw. And, like, I mean, again, like I said before, like, there's some bad actors. And I think, like, uh, that kind of it annoyed me and he you know he was kind of he was validating it for whatever reason and i don't know like that kind of stuff um you know shooting hundreds of whatever animal and posting about it um i think you know that that kind of stuff like annoys me to a to a degree i think just the general um social media aspect of it has set somewhat of like unrealistic expectations and the led to over commercialization of the hunting industry um i mean i don't know i think it's cool to to, to some extent like some of the meat eater guys like i know um you know they have a pretty strong presence on on, on netflix and most people who aren't hunters like know who they are just from the netflix mm -hmm. uh shows but um and i think it's cool that they're kind of expanding the sport to an extent but like the days of like going up um you know, going, going up to your cabin and with your family and just kind of making that like your, you know, your weekend away and doing that as kind of a tradition is it, it seems to be going, going by the wayside for all these different gear, you know, gadgets and gear upgrades and all that it's kind of, you want the biggest, like biggest buck or, or whatever, like you're, you're passing up on deer that would otherwise be a good, you know, a good shot. And most people would celebrate because you're, you're getting, I don't know, you're seeing all these social media guys like posting these massive bucks that they probably shot on a farm somewhere and um, posting about it and going on these elaborate stories of what they did or didn't do. Um, I don't know. I, I think that part of it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. It's interesting that social media has impacted hunting. That's not something I would have thought of, like yeah. the downstream effects of that. But it does make sense. You put mm -hmm. a giant picture of a... A, a picture of a giant buck on your Instagram. I guess that does get you a lot of yeah. kudos, I imagine. So is it the idea that shooting something yeah. bigger is harder or they're just more rare? It's just like, I got the biggest one. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's like the fish, right? Like yeah. you want the biggest fish. Um, you kind of want the biggest buck and you're going to get it. 
you know, you get it mounted and hang it on your wall and there's a story and like yeah everyone wants that and i i want that if there's if there's a big buck coming through like i'm gonna get excited i'm gonna you know get get buck fever and, and kind of whatever but it's like um i don't know i just think it like took it to another level and then you have these other you have you have some of these folks who are like there was this, this couple who's a social media whatever that that influencers that were were convicted or charged with with poaching right so they're mm-hmm. hunting on there and at a time they weren't able to and then like yeah maybe you're setting yourself up for you're putting yourself at a at an advantage for hunting an area or a time that you're not supposed to be um versus you know the re- you know the average person kind of going to their hunting cabin on the weekend after working all week or something so like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i don't know so i'm just a- thinking about the fishing again and were you aware of mm-hmm. the big fishing scandal like in competition fishing oh class, yeah where the guy yeah they were, the they were throwing like weights in it yeah that seems that's pretty crazy crazy to me and I, so yeah. my question with that first is what is the skill involved with catching a larger fish my first thought isn't it just luck like what chews on your line so is it knowing that that's a small one so you let it go I just don't understand why catching a big fish is related to your skill. Yeah, I don't know. That's probably a question for how of it. Um, <laughs> but, but but I, I agree with you to some extent. I think, you know, maybe in these competitions, and I'm not familiar with how they work uh, entirely, but, you know, could have you, you mentioned it before, like knowing, knowing like what kind of or what size fish are where and strategizing of like which fish you're throwing back because my understanding is you keep like a certain number of fish in those things and then Mm. it's the total weight or the average weight or something so like i don't know the strategy around keeping or tossing fish back um i'm sure comes into play based on experience and knowing the waters but as far as like how to get bigger fish like i not the slightest clue (laughs) i uh I, i go fishing occasionally with my kids and whatever comes up we're happy with right i love the super niche but very dedicated fan bases for these very small type of events like fishing. And when I was talking to Milkmaid, like the World Dairy Expo and everyone's like live streaming it in her (laughs) college. Like that's so fun. (laughs) Like just the the uproar around these smaller communities of people are so invested in like the idea of shoving weights down a fish's mouth to fraudulently <laughs> when the competition i just yeah like, it's kind of hysterical what was crazy yeah when, when you saw the um when when you saw the video people were like the all the other people there were were, were very very pissed off and oh, like yeah. I, I was talking to someone else about it and they're like well yeah they they've been in these competitions and they've given up um however much in prize money to these guys right. and who knows how long that's been going on for so like I get it. And and like you said, like all these people are so passionate and it's like their world and it's their community. And it's like, uh, it's a little bit of a slap in the face when someone kind of just blatantly lies. It, you know? Yeah. I'd be pissed. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I don't know. Just fascinating. All I'm learning so much from this podcast mm-hmm. and all those little kind of smaller areas of just very interesting, unique yeah. things. Um, one thing that I was listening to on Joe Rogan was about the idea mm-hmm. that people grow or cultivate their land to be super attractive to animals for the sole Mm -hmm. purpose of hunting. So like there was this guy who had a ton of land and he was growing really tall grass so that the elk would come through. And he was very particular about never touching it with his hands or like just being very, very strict about the the cultivation of it. So it would be the perfect hunting. Do you have any experience with that? Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I think there's there's a there's a cool account in the jungle. Um, both had low rider. He, um, uh, I've been following him for a little bit, and he talks a lot about that, and he kind of does that to an extent with with his property. It seems, um, but yeah, I think there's there's varying levels of that, right? Like there's there's the the fenced off properties that are you know feeding whatever they're feeding to these deer and they're looking you know they're they're walking around looking like dinosaurs with 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 the racks on their heads um that to me is not really hunting it's you know you're paying to go shoot an animal that's an offensive piece of property um and in fact like 
those types of animals um there's a, like an official scoring system on um the size of the deer's rack um like they won't even count those like it's 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 not a valid score if you shoot shoot a farm raised deer um but then there's also people who and i think like that's what lowrider kind of does is they'll plant feeding areas and we do it to an extent on our property um there's a whole thing of like quality deer management and land management and understanding um you know the land around it and the deer that are on your property so um you know one is like planting whatever you know high protein mm. call it alfalfa or whatever on the property and knowing that the deer know like okay there's a food source there they're eating that and then understanding that there's you know bedding area on your property and leaving a piece of the property alone to never be touched that's the deer state zone otherwise you'll scare them off your property um and then you know knowing like where they're eating and sleeping and that so you can kind of know your property and ma and, and managing this with with you know a bunch of different trail cameras throughout your property um so like there's there two different things and i think like the one in, in a fenced off kind of area is completely different and kind of silly in my mind but but if you're investing your time in your in your property um and, and planting all of these you know these crops and kind of for the un, you know for the deer i mean that's cool i think it's it's obviously dedication and people will people will grow and buy land and do exactly that um and kind of everywhere in between from just like letting it letting it go and just hunting like wherever your land is um just kind of doing everything in between right and, and prepping your land in, in advance if it's just like trimming some trees and you know making a little bit of a natural funnel and all that kind of stuff so i think you have to i think you have to do some of that for land that you own um but obviously you can't do that if you're hunting on public property and you're just kind of going out there and, and, and looking at the land and setting up accordingly I am so excited by the prospect of having my own land like that yeah. <laughs> or just like the grounds. You should be. Uh, that's just yeah. the dream, man. That is the dream. Big garden. It's, it is. Yeah. yeah. And you have all of that already. Yeah. I mean, so, so the, yeah, the property, uh, the, the cabin, like we, we can't really have a, have the garden there, right? We're not up there enough, but right. um, we'll, we'll, we'll plant some crops to um, kind of feed the deer Um and, and manage it similar to how, how I alluded to earlier. Um, but yeah, you gotta, you gotta get the, uh, you know, the garden going, the chicken coop right in, in the primary. Um, what a good tradition for the family to all go do that. That's such a nice, yeah, a nice thing to do. Definitely. No, I think it's better. And, and it's funny cause like my kids, my kids are younger, but they're, they're starting to get into it. My oldest is, is, you know, loves talking to me about it, especially mm -hmm. during hunting season. He loves coming along with me. Um, so it's cool. And I think the challenge for me at this point in my life is like aside from just like managing like dad duties and the day to day stuff, but like also like tastefully introducing them to hunting and um, kind of exposing them to hunting without you know, overdoing it and, and kind of turning them off to it because they're at a weird age, right? Like some the younger kids, if they see you cut a deer open mm. like that might just be it for them and, and they're done so like kind of managing that has been um it's been cool um but, but certainly a trial and error and learning curve for me yeah that is a delicate age i will say my dad is a big cyclist not totally relevant but mm -hmm. he would take us on bike rides when we were little and he pushed us a little too mm -hmm. hard and now none of us yeah. ride bikes anymore so <laughs> Yeah, I, I see that. It's funny. I see that with everything like sports and like those parents just want their kid to be the best, whatever, or do whatever their hobby is. And it's like, if you push them too much, they're not going to do it. I think you just have to show them and kind of lead by example and, and they'll either flock to it or not. You can't, you can't force it. Yeah. And I could see with hunting how, especially with girls, I don't know if you have girls, that would be a mm -hmm. tough introduction to see that. So I, um, I get why you need to do that a little bit slower and tastefully before you show them that yeah that. um but very very cool family tradition um so with your twitter account what is kind of the dream what are you hoping to do with this what would you like to show people teach people i'm all ears no yeah no that's a good question um yeah like i said i just kind of started it right like when i found the jungle um 
I was like, wow, cool. Like a group of people who think like me. Um, mm -hmm. So that's like refreshing to be around. Um, so I wanted to kind of get into that world and, you know, participate. And um, I noticed there wasn't really, there's a, I guess what's cool is there's so many people in the jungle who are outdoorsmen or mm -hmm. those, you know, involved in the outdoors. So it was cool to like connect with them and interact with them. Um, and so I, I just kind of jumped in, but like, I didn't necessarily have a plan of like what I wanted to do with it. Um, and I've thought about it and, uh, you know, I go back and forth, but I think like for now, like what I wanted to do was kind of just spread knowledge. There's been some cool, you know, plenty of people who have, um, you know, reached out to me and asked me questions about when it mm -hmm. gets started and like, so kind of focus on that. And then also like, post some of the stuff like i like i said like i'm go i have young kids like i'm going through it live and i'm just kind of sharing my experiences introducing my kids to it and you know i obviously went through it myself with my dad um but things changed times are weird like you can't just go into school and talk you know my yeah. we got a call from my son's teacher like like oh he was talking about like shooting animals um oh, gosh. like well yeah of course he was yeah. um but like um so it's just like a different um different world and like he doesn't mean it in like a you know a negative way like it's right, just right, like right. that's what he talks to me about and he thought like that's what everyone else wants to talk about you know mm -hmm. um so like just basically just sharing that um but but i think down the road like i'd love to i've explored some like you know different types of products to use yeah things that i can kind of make myself i've talked to um parrot fish and some others um Kind of kind of craft that and think about like the e-commerce side of things and then and then Halbert and i are working on uh we have a substack of just kind of talking you know we're kind of a similar similar vibe um right on kind of what we're doing with our accounts and kind of sharing the knowledge there but but we we started what we call jung jungle pursuits and basically just sharing stories and knowledge of hunting and fishing and just trying to uh you know spread the the knowledge of of, of you know getting and being outdoors and, and kind of talking through that so We'll see what comes of that, but just kind of keeping it broad based and obviously open to, to any suggestions from from anyone who uh, thinks there may be a product or a solution or anything like that that you know I could kind of run with. It's not really anonymous, but I'd love to be taken on a hunting trip up to the family cabin. Now yeah. that would be fun. You could do really <laughs> specific trips yeah. and stuff, but obviously not anonymous. Definitely, so that would be so cool Definitely. to see a pro. That would be fun. Um. Yeah, oh, I was talking to Gator this morning, actually, about how duos mm -hmm. in the jungle do really well. So, like, him and Fawn do all the skincare and the dental care. But then there's also yeah. Cobra and uh, Bangle that do Bangle. therapy. There's you and there's Halibut. Like, it's really interesting how the duos yeah. are kind of sprouting up because it's yeah. like very powerful in building a community. And you can have banter with each other, which people like to listen to. Mm -hmm. I don't have a, a duo partner. Maybe I should try to find one. A co-host. Yeah. <laughs> but That'd be fun. It's, it's That'd interesting. Be fun. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's cool. I mean, like I said, it's cool. Like all, most most everyone there is 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 similarly, you know, wired as I am and kind of thinking through the world we're in now. And it's it's it is refreshing, especially talking to someone, some of these folks who are also involved in the outdoors. Um, you know, whether or not they're their niche within the jungle is that but like you know which my dad is a big hunter mm -hmm. um you know there's a, there's a bunch of bunch of them in there and it's cool to talk to those guys about it too so i find it interesting that you found the jungle refreshing solely because you know a dad that's a part of a big hunting family and community i would find a lot of like-minded people so would you say that even where you mm -hmm. are it's not so much you're still a little bit on the outs like of course i'm on the outs i'm a young woman in a big yeah. city. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, listen, I think the family stuff and, and, and the folks at the cabin, um, certainly, but, but I kind of growing up, what I, what I was always a little bit jealous of is like, we'd go to the cabin and it'd be like my dad's friends and my uncle's friends and my grandfather's friends. And then it's like me and my brothers, my cousins, but like none of our friends. So like, mm. I think we were just at like the lost generation with or, or, or the hunting kind of lost our generation. Um, and so like the friends that I have are not really into it. Like they're interested in it, but no one's ever done it. Um, and then, you know, without necessarily like 
it's not, it's not necessarily doxing, but like I, I work at a white collar organization and um, like no one there does it. Right? right. So it's, it's interesting. And like those people are, are very much uh, like opposite that, that I am in, in kind of a lot of ways. So it's like, it's interesting. But what was also interesting is throughout COVID, um, I mean, you saw nationally that the hunting license applications and hunting licenses went up pretty dramatically for the first time in a while. Right. And I, I was, I, so many people reached out to me like, hey, how do I get licensed? Um, can you take me? Can you, you know, show me what to do? Um, you know, I just bought a gun. Like, can you help me shoot it? All that stuff. Like, so that was kind of cool to see that, but it, but it seems to have kind of circled back to, you know, pre-COVID levels and all of that. So, um, I don't know, but, but like being in with, with these folks, um, you know, in the jungle is, is, is I feel like it's more peers who are, who are thinking like I am and, and, and kind of involved in the same kind of things that I am versus, you know, maybe my, my dad's friends and uncles and mm-hmm. all that. Mm-hmm. That was the most addicting part of the jungle when I first joined was that it was the first time in a long time I felt like I could relate to the people talking. I didn't feel like I was shouting into the void about yeah whatever. Um, so that was the most attractive part at the beginning for sure. Um, you mentioned people came to you and asked like, hey, I just bought a gun. I want to get started. I've never shot mm-hmm. a gun in my life. How could I... Mm-hmm. Should I go to like a shooting range? Should I take a class? Like, well, how could I get going? Yeah. Yeah. I think like knowing someone, if you know someone, um, and I think this goes for broader, just like hunting in general, but mm-hmm. like for shooting specifically, like you, it's obviously um, like there's some sort of danger involved in it. Right. Um, so like knowing someone who kind of knows what they're doing, I would go with them and figure it out. If you, don't have someone that knows what they're doing Mm. um yeah look up look up like an nra course or something like that and go to a shooting range join like a pistol club or you know rifle club or something like that sportsman's club um and work with someone there you just got to find someone that's going to kind of be a mentor and i think that's the biggest um you know the biggest thing for all all for all of hunting is like having the having that mentor um and most people are more than willing to lend a hand to this kind of stuff because kind of like i alluded to earlier like it's it's somewhat of a dying um you know hobby and and it's kind of, people want to spread their hobby and kind of share with their knowledge with other people who don't know and and then you kind of have a friend to do it with so um mm. yeah i would i would i would look into some courses or something yeah Definitely on the to-do list. Um, yeah, you should. Yeah. It's such a romantic lifestyle. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think to a degree that like some some people have a, a little bit of a, of a fantasy of like reverting back to the primitive days yeah. and yeah. and all that, which is cool. But like, I do think, especially you know, with the COVID stuff and the lockdowns and everything, like being able to want to like get out of your house or go do something that you enjoy doing um without worrying about like anyone else is is refreshing but also like knowing like if shit really hit the fan you can feed your family you yes. can kind of survive on your own a little bit um not worry about the you know surging prices of beef or mm-hmm. surging prices of whatever meat and eggs and all of that stuff like you kind of have that for yourself and I don't know there's something I think there's something set for that as well. Yeah, I think especially for a man learning to be able to do that, it does add a level mm-hmm. of like confidence or comfort in himself. Yeah, totally. I think that makes a ton of so. sense. Um, but yeah. Well, yeah. This has been super fun. Is there anything else that you wanted to discuss? No. No, I mean we we covered a lot. I mean, I could talk for hours on this. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's um it, yeah, it's cool. I, I I think just like I love sharing kind of what I know and not that I know everything, but like I love sharing what I know with people who are, you know, less familiar with it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so hopefully hopefully there's there's folks that listen to this and kind of get a different perspective of hunting who, you know, wouldn't have otherwise and um yeah, happy to answer questions, DMs or or whatever. Um I I love chatting about it and love helping people. Yeah. 
This was super insightful and you answered all of my newbie questions. So I really appreciate that. Awesome. Um, for anyone who is listening, I imagine you'd like to direct them to your Twitter, but anywhere else you'd want to point mm -hmm. them right now. Yeah. So, so the Twitter is just bow tied smile it on. Um, and, and you can check out our sub stack that I had mentioned with, mm -hmm. um, I've been working on some stuff with Halibut. Uh, so that's kind of everything outdoors, hunting and fishing, um, again, similar kind of thought process of, of getting people exposed to it and kind of explaining the basics and then some um and that's jungle pursuits um the subject is jungle pursuits so you can kind of search that it's also it's a good name. linked on my profile as well um, yeah yeah good name i, I like it. came up with it so, <laughs> yeah okay no kudos <laughs> to you then um <laughs> yeah exactly well thank you so much for taking the time and have a great rest of your night thank you you as well